So good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everyone that are here today in the 14th Home Gemology webinar supported by Sibjo, the World Jewelry Confederation. And today with Edward Johnson also giving him his precious support and uh, in, 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 the back, in, in, the, in, in the back studio. We are going to discuss uh, colored gemstones in jewelry. And to do so, we have a really very special guest, uh, Lisa Pnalva. She's the, uh, the curator of uh, silver, um, gold, and jewelry collections at the Museo Nacional de Arte Antiga, which is um, the antique museum of, uh, no, not antique museum, the Museum for Antique Art here in Lisbon, uh, actually quite, quite uh, close from where I live. And um, she will be there at the museum, which is actually now closed to the public, but uh, she will guide us through the collection in a very special way. Um, good evening, uh, Luisa. I know that you can hear me. I'm going hi. to unmute her microphone hi. and... Uh, hi, Edward. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. Hello, everyone. Again. Uh, thank you Rui, for the invitation and uh, for me, for my part and from the museum, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's a, quite an effort to be here because everything is closed and uh, we have everything put aside, but uh, we chose some, some jewels, I think you'll like it. And um, uh, let's move on because on, in the morning we didn't have time to show everything, so I'll be quiet now. <laughs> and uh, 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 Louisa, uh, People have no idea what they are going to see, but they will see in your hand really special uh, pieces of jewelry of yeah. our national collections. And that's really a privilege that mm -hmm. only a few can experience. And in the morning, we had 600 lucky ones doing that. And this afternoon, we have up until now 423 people joining us. So it's about 1,000 people. They will have the opportunity to watch you and listen to you as a jewelry historian expert on 18th century jewelry showing our national treasure. So thank you very much for accepting this invitation, Lisa. It's a pleasure. I love to, to show them. I know. <laughs> so I'm going, I'm going to not, not to delay any more this webinar. So I'm going to share my screen and start the, um, and start the what we call a presentation. So what we'll cover today is uh, I will do a very short historical context to, for you to understand why the 18th century is so critical. And also, we will mention briefly diamonds in the 18th century jewelry, Brazilian diamonds. That was also a, a topic for a previous webinar, so three, four weeks ago. And of course, the colored gemstones, mostly topaz, chrysoberyl, quartz varieties, and also beryl, I was forgetting. This is the end of the day, everybody's really tired. And we will also discuss the foil backings and painted culets. We, you will get, uh, you will understand what it is later on. And doublets, which is the assembled composite products that have been going on on the industry for ages. And you will see some really nice examples in Portuguese 18th century jewelry. But um, let's do, let's go back uh, to the medieval ages and understand what was used in Portugal, particularly in Portugal, on, <laughs> on those days. And it was mostly ver a very small variety of gems, and they were almost all cut in cabochons or in rough pebbles, sometimes drilled. And the, the amount of gems and the variety of their gem varieties, uh, sorry, the redundance of the speech was very limited. So you could see, you didn't see diamonds, but you could see sapphires, rubies, emeralds, um, garnets, quartz varieties like rock crystal and some very little quantities of amethyst. And also, of course, pearls, shell, coral, and if you wish, lapis lazuli and uh, agates and turquoise. But what I want to convey is the amount of materials was quite limited and the shapes, the cuts were quite interesting because it was always cabochons, meaning polished round surfaces and also uh, drilled beads. 
when we come to the 17th century and 16th century, after the Portuguese discovered the sea route to India, yeah, it, it was we, it was us, the Portuguese, and uh, with Vasco da Gama here on the, uh, this portrait, we actually made it to India and uh, very early in the 16th century, actually in the late 15th century, we established a very important place in Goa in, in 1510, and Lisbon became the world capital of luxury. And if we would go back 500 years, and this is a portrait that depicts uh, one very important uh, road of Lisbon, not anymore because of the earthquake, but Lisbon was actually a global city. We could see people from all over Europe, from Africa, from Asia, from the Americas, and we could see natural products and art from all over the world. And this is 500 years ago. And this painting that you see on the screen, actually it looks like two paintings, but it used to be one single painting that somehow in the history was divided into two. And uh, there is a story about it, but not, not, not concerning us on this webinar. And this one was the theme of a grand exhibition that was held in Louisa's museum a couple of years ago, curated by Anne-Marie Jordan, a great jewelry historian from the 16th century. And on the 16th century, we had, of course, in jewelry, diamonds from Brazil, oh, sorry, diamonds from India and from Borneo, Borneo, Indonesia, but mostly from India. We had pearls from the Persian Gulf, pearls from the Caribbean, pearls from the uh, uh, Gulf of Manar between Sri Lanka and India. We had a lot of rock crystal, both made in Italy, carved in Italy, but also carved in Sri Lanka and also in India. And of course, the, all the emeralds that came by the, brought by the Spanish from Nueva Granada, which is today's Colombia, to Sevilla, and then they traveled all around Europe and also to Lisbon. And of course, sapphires, rubies, and Spinel. So Lisbon was actually the capital of precious stones in the 16th century. Then it lost a little bit of momentum by the 17th century, but we were great 500 years ago. So let's go into the 18th century. And what's special about the 18th century is when you look at jewelry before and after diamonds from Brazil, you can see a change. A change not only in the quantity of diamonds that you can see being used, but also a change in the cuts, also a change, also, and Louisa, she will explain all about, about it, a, a change in the aesthetics of, of how the jewel was, was manufactured. And if you can look at this image, you will see the three kinds of cuts that were quite common in the 16th and 17th century and early 18th century jewelry before the, um, before the, the so-called brilliant cut became really popular in the 1750s. Uh, the brilliant cut was available already at the 17th century, but became really popular only in the mid 18th century. And Luisa, I know that you have a few things that you want to share with us concerning this uh, topic that I was just entertaining people with, which is the, the diamonds and the, uh, and the cuts and the use of diamonds. Yeah, uh, well, I picked two uh, before 18th century. I picked two from 17th century. Uh, it's difficult to pick something from our collection because we have over 2,500 pieces. So as you can imagine, it's quite difficult. But just to explain to the matter of um, the matter of, the, of the, the, the importance of the diamonds, for instance, in the 17th century jewels, I, I think you can see it. Well, right Can you now, put a bit closer, Luisa? Yeah, sure. Um, That's more like, like it. Okay. Uh, you can see the, the, the diamonds are only on, applied on the, central, uh, on the central elements, but there are several uh, dozens of chips of diamonds applied. What, why do, do we have this? Because uh, the, the work was so heavily worked, it's so fine, the, the, the work of gold, that it can be um, uh, sort of a difficult to look at. And the diamonds were used here to make some spots of light, some spots of shining and bringing some reading to the, to the piece itself. 
obviously were in, um, enriching the, the piece itself, but they, they were used also for the eye. So you can see it better what's happening. One thing I'm going to show you, because we already sent, uh, show it on, the, on other pieces, on other webinars, is the back of the piece. Can you see it? It's engraved. And I think they're beautiful. The 17th century pieces are absolutely stunning in the back. Some of them, you can even see the, the, uh, some tulips, like the ones that were um, traveling, th those drawings that were traveling through Europe. And you could see them engraved. I have another one, which is quite different. This one, you see this one. Um, well, let me, I'm going to do another thing, which I do in the morning, is that much better. And it's That's a good idea, Louisa. That's a really And you're doing idea. this much better like this. So you can see the, the piece right now is a, mm -hmm. is a, a breast ornament or a devant de corsage. And you can look, it's made in three parts, central one and two, and two, two other parts that they are detachable. But here you can see it mounted in silver, which usually diamonds were mounted in silver because of its grayish tone. Uh, we're not talking about fancy colored diamonds. So you see, I, I learned something from you. Uh, I've learned a lot from you. But uh, these ones are very, can you see it like this? They are rose cut diamonds. And you can see yeah. properly like this. This is already, a, well, this is a diamond with a, a jewel around it. The diamonds are much bigger. You see the, the, the shine of them, but they're still doing like this, uh, you can see, the, uh, let me do this, the longitud uh, longitudinal line here, and you can see it better, this, the piece like this. Exactly. Because and with that, the scrolling is, so, is a bit confusing. So it's useful for this. Let me show this one on the back. It's amazing. Look at the work wow. of the wow. engraving. I think you can see it, and you see the three parts, and you see the way you can put the, 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 the ribbon inside and you attach it to the to the dress so Lisa, um, is it fair to say that the the goldsmith was like a sculpture of precious metals on those days yeah by the, by then yes you can because some of these pieces were made in several parts and sometimes in several layers this is one layer but this this goes on top and sometimes you have two or three, and three layers. So it's kind of a sculpture, it's almost a 3D, a three dimension, uh, dimensional uh, jewel. This one belonged to a queen of Portugal called Luisa, like me. Uh, I'm called like her as well. Uh, but uh, she was, uh, she, it was discovered, traditionally said to be discovered on her, on her grave. Um, but well, this is an amazing piece and I have some questions about it, but anyway. I think this is uh, one very interesting piece. Now I'm going to show you another one because it's transitioned to the 18th century. And look at this, this is a very tiny piece. Can you see it well? Yes. Uh, this is very interesting. This is a hair ornament. What is, what is, mean, is meant to, to uh, stick it on a wig because it's quite nasty. Look at this, it's really hard. And on the paintings, you can see the ladies, of the court ladies, wearing several of them uh, uh, well, with a structure, obviously, inside the, the wig, and they, they could uh, took it, uh, pin them, pin them on, the, on the wigs. What is important, this one? Because it's enamel. And the difference between, one of the major difference between the 17th and the 18th century uh, jewels is that before that, and even from the Middle Ages, the enamel was quite popular. You, you can use, you could use enamel on a metal, could be gold or can, could be silver, just to give color to the, to the uh, silver work or gold work. But the enamel is very difficult to, to work with, especially with mixed colors like this one. You can see the red, this red should be uh, red, much more reddish and turned a bit purple, a little bit brownish because too much heat did change the color. So when the stones and gems are starting to arrive from the late 17th and beginning of 18th century in Portugal, the amounts of stone were so, so big, uh, so huge. And you can see on the ship manifestos that they change, they start using, instead of enamel, which was more difficult and take longer to do, to apply, they start 
just using stones. There were so many colors, so many shades of colors, so many quantities, and they were so cheap, they start using them. Obviously, the, the diamonds were, it's a different kind of uh, story, but you can find, and you're going to see now, I'm going to show you afterwards, but I think I'm, I have to stop now. You're going to stop talk. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's your turn. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm no, it's on. okay. It's okay. It's passion. It end, always just... takes over, which is, uh, that's what's inspiring. Yeah, in our we just industry. keep quiet and I'll do it at the end. At the end. <laughs> Thank you very much, I'm Louise. Sorry. I'm going to share my screen again and carry on with the oh, presentation. Oh, you, you mean, you mean. <laughs> okay. So oh, but you wanted to show again. some more? Because people, they, no, they no, prefer no, no, to... No, uh, no, you go on. You go on with the PowerPoint now. Uh, I'm off. Okay. I'm off. I go on with the boring stuff and you will... Because <laughs> I'm being jealous that you are much more of a star now than I am. Because you no, are showing me. all the, the beautiful... Jewels. The jewels, not me. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's continue and uh, let's uh, explain what uh, the context of what Luisa was saying. Actually, Portugal was on, oh, one of the first countries exploring a lot of cholera gemstones aside the main four ones which is ruby sapphire spinel at the time and also emerald and we 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 did have uh, access to brazil but this has a that has a as an origin historical origin when we got it to brazil in the 15th in the 16th century and uh, by the way if you are from brazil raise your hand because i'm sure there is a lot of brazilians today and we got there, uh, Pedro Alves Cabral and all the Brazilian people, or there, a lot of them, you know the story. And when we got there, this is what we found. We found bush, forest, and ladies and gentlemen, no caipirinha, okay, uh, whatsoever. And our Spanish friends that were our enemies, on their colonies, they were finding gold, platinum. They didn't care much about platina, platinum and also silver, and also emeralds in Nueva Granada, in today's Colombia, and also a lot of pearls from Panama, Venezuela, Mexico. And so they were getting rich. And we, in Brazil, we had the bush, parrots, no caipirinha. And on those days, people didn't care about the beach. So, Paradise like this one, I would love to be on the paradise like this at the moment, but they didn't care. What happened was they decided to do something and they had hired really brave men from Sao Paulo to go into the bush and look for the precious stuff. And eventually they did find gold in the late 17th century. And because they were looking at the ground looking for gold, searching for gold, because gold appeared on riverbeds, they eventually found diamonds. And diamonds was a huge, major mineral discovery in Minas Gerais around 1725. It doesn't matter the precise date, but the important thing is the quantity of diamonds that started to arrive in Europe was huge compared with the ones that were brought from India. And that created quite something in jewelry. And I'm going to just illustrate a few examples. And Louisa, she, she just illustrated a couple with you. And uh, look at this 1758 jewel. And here, mid 18th century, brilliant cut, which is the case, was already in fashion, was already popular. And can I draw your attention for that spot, that black spot that you see on the culet of that diamond? And the black spot has a significance. This piece of jewelry, and almost all of them in the 18th century, even with diamonds, they were set in closed settings, meaning that uh, the diamond was set on a... Let, oh, I have a box here. You see this box? The diamond was set on a box like this. So it was closed from behind. And the bottom on, on the, um, the substrate of that box, sorry, I, I missed the vocabulary, was black because it was painted black or because it was oxidized silver, but it was black. And sometimes it was a product in there. Of course, diamonds, if you look at them, 
through the table facet down to the pavilion through the QLED, you would see the back of the box that is black, hence the black dot. And that black dot became quite popular in brilliant cut diamonds. And if you wanted to simulate a diamond, you needed that black dot. And this will be used, this will be use, useful for us in a couple of minutes when we will address uh, other gemstones that try to imitate diamonds. And in the 18th century, uh, our crown jewels, you just saw one example real quick, and this is another one. Uh, it's a, a nice examples from the late 18th century where the concept of jewelry changed quite a lot and the profession of a gemstone setter became quite important, Louisa. Now I know that you have a couple of things to say about this. Louisa, I think she was this. <laughs> Louisa, uh, I'm going uh, to- Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I was trying Did to. I caught you in surprise. Uh, I was no, 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 no. I was arranging the, brilliant for the, for the jewels. And the, uh... I was trying to be more professional than, than this morning. No, so trying are. to have. You uh, are uh, great, Louisa. <laughs> okay, so when we decide to to choose some uh, jewels from this collection, which is absolutely stunning, and so many, we have so many. Uh, we decided to go more or less by colors because it's difficult to 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 choose from all of them. So uh, we I chose this one from Criso Barrels, and I think it's absolutely stunning. This type of um, this is a, what we call a brooch or a pendant. Uh, this shape here uh, is a, is a later on on this, the 18th century, but still this shape of these kind of uh, pieces came from the 17th century bows. First, they were in textiles, and then they became became in metal and and diamonds, and then they start becoming become more and more complicated until the bow shape disappeared, and if anything anything could be done, like these cross palms like this. But this kind of uh, pendants on three pendant is quite typical from the 18th century. is called girandole in French or girandola in Portuguese. Uh, and um, and I'd like to see this this kind of paving that brings another another important thing from the 18th century, which is um, when you start applying gemstones, the gemstones there was the amount of gemstones available was so many that it was no, not necessary to show metal before you see like the the ones in the in the let me show you this ones again. This one's on the 17th century. You can see the metals and the jewels were applied to a purpose. Here is the opposite. The purpose of the metal is only to, to hold the, the gemstones. So this is important because all the, all the metal disappear and you just see the paving of, uh, uh, of the gemstones. This is yellow uh, crystal barrels that we can speak much better from, from, uh, uh, about them. Uh, and this one, is a, um, a necklace with the Holy Spirit as a several of these kind of pieces with uh, the dove like this, uh, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. But this is kind of a French, a double bow, a French bow. And we can find several interesting, this is an interesting mixture. We can find several of these pieces like with chrysal barrels and amethysts. Uh, they became quite fashionable, this type of, uh, of a combination and one thing is also important for the 18th century that you can fall almost follow the way that the mines were discovered because the the as as they were discovered and this explored the amount of uh, the big amount of uh, of the stones that they were finding that in that those mines arrived to lisbon and then the market was flooded with a color and because it was flooded with a color and it was cheapest to do it, also the fashion changed and the, the, even the, the, the fashion in the fabrics and the way of dressing changed to go with the color of the jewels. So it's, it's very interesting to see the, 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 during the 18th century how this goes. Also, we could do this kind of mixture and this is very, more rare in Portugal, like we said, 
the, uh, we didn't have much uh, emeralds, sorry. Uh, we have, uh, this one has emeralds and rubies and the, and the crystal barrels again, but this is a very flowery thing. And one thing I didn't explain yet uh, is that our collection uh, is mainly, is, was mainly done in uh, or gathered in the 19th century from the assets that came from the, the, the extinction or the expulsion of the Catholic Church from, the, from Portugal. And when the, the, they were expelled, all the churches, convents, uh, monasteries were closed and their assets came to the state. So you ask, how come um, a church has uh, jewels? Well, you can't forget that uh, many widows or, um, or daughters from the, uh, that didn't marry had some problem, whatever, that went to a convent from rich families, obviously, they had a dowry. Also, if you have a problem in your family, imagine you have a child with a problem and you make a promise to a virgin or a saint you prefer that, you're, that, you, that you are devoted to, you can make a promise and ask for a mercy plea and do a mercy plea and ask him if it saves you or saves your child or your husband or whatever you wanted, you gave your best jewel. That's how the jewels went to the conference, and that's why they are so important. This, this treasure is so important in this museum because they were untouched. Many, many jewels, uh, even in families, there are still a lot of them in Portugal. There are a lot of families that still have them as an heirloom to many times from daughter to daughter. And, but this, these uh, pieces in, in, in the churches, they weren't changed. The, the taste can change. You can recut and ask to be recut the stones, especially diamonds. But these ones stayed on the precise shape they were offered to the churches and the convents. So that's why we have such a big treasure. And we just received one from another church in Lisbon that, that they, they make a deposit of them. It's a wonderful treasure, marvelous pieces. You saw them. We, and uh, we are studying them. They are going to be um, on the new exhibition that we, are, we were expecting to open uh, on the 18th, but it's impossible. So we're going to open uh, by the end of the year, we hope. By the end, until the end of the year, we can open them. So uh, this is an example of jewels we have. We have a lot of them. Uh, these are crystal barrels, but I'm going to pass the word so I can change the jewels and put another one, another set, okay? That's marvelous. Thank you very much. You are like, like those automatic cars. You just press the, the speed and, and there you go. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> and the, by, by the way, everyone, this is what happens when you have a passion. It's so hard to control because it's, it, it's emotional. For those of you that attended Enzo Liverino webinar on precious coral, it's the same kind of passion. So that is really, that is really amazing. So I'm going to continue uh, Louisa, she just introduced a little bit of what I'm going to say um, after the discovery of diamonds in Brazil, because everybody, everyone was looking at the ground, some more uh, gems came into action. And one of them was amethyst that you saw a couple of examples a, a few minutes ago. And this uh, aura, which is from a, from a sacred image, represents quite well what was the situation of amethyst in the 18th century. Today, amethyst is quite common. We know that it comes from many parts of the world, especially from uh, Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil and also neighboring Uruguay. But those major finds are only at the first quarter of the 19th century, because before that, amethyst was found in Europe here and there, not in huge quantities, up until the 18th century when it was found in great quantities, but not the crazy quantities that you could find later on in 19th century in Uruguay and also in Brazil. And Minas Gerais produced quite good quality amethyst, but they had a problem in producing the same color consistently. That's why, and you can see this well on this picture, and uh, maybe Louisa, she can show you on a, on a real thing on her hand, that underneath each and every amethyst on this silver aura, there is a colored foil back. You know what is a bonbon? Bonbon, I think, is an international word for a chocolate. 
And usually bonbons in my time, which is like a half a century ago, they used to be wrapped on a certain silvery colored paper, very shiny one. And if you use that kind of, not, not the bonbon paper, but imagine a piece of silver that is polished to be reflective. And then you use a certain colorant, a certain pigment to stain that silver background. And, and remember the box? So in the closed setting, you just place, oh, I have here some paper. Okay. You just place the colored paper in there, you place the stone, you set the stone on top, and you have a colored foil bag. And all of those amethysts that you see on the screen, they are not the same color, but because they have a colored foil bag, they look like they are the same color. And this foil backing is quite interesting. And you can see that in many gem materials, Brazilian gem materials of the 18th century. Chrysoberyl, uh, Luizinha, she also uh, mentioned them. Maybe those of you that are gemologists, you know chrysoberyl because it's the mineral that gives rise to the alexandrite, the color changing alexandrite, for instance. Very, very famous. Comes from Myanmar, from Brazil, from Sri Lanka, and from Russia. But the greenish yellow chrysoberyl, which is not that expensive, it was quite popular in the late 18th century, early 19th century. And this set of buttons that you see over here, and this, this set of jewels, and the, you just saw uh, very similar ones from the, uh, from the museum uh, that Louisa showed, they are quite typical of the use of chrysoberyl. This is a lavish use of chrysoberyl in the late 18th century, early 19th century. And this is quite Portuguese to say, to, to say the least. And the other one, and before I give the floor again to Luisa, because if I give her the floor now, she won't give the floor back to me. So I'm going to speak about one more gemstone before I give her back the floor, is topaz. And probably topaz is the most important color gemstone that was found in Brazil in the 1730s around that. Because in Brazil, in Ouro Preto, particularly in Ouro Preto, in Minas Gerais, it's the only place on the planet that even today produces commercial quantities of this time of gem quality topaz. Yellow topazes, they were known in Saxony, Germany in the 18th century and before, but not in, in this kind of orange, not this kind of reddish, not this kind of pinkish. This is exclusive in commercial quantities from Ouro Preto in Brazil. Even the reddish ones, they could be called Brazilian rubies. That was a trade name at, at the time. And here, for those of you that live in Portugal or have been in Portugal, you look at this picture and this is Ouro Preto, a UNESCO heritage place. The, it's a really a treasury, architectural treasuries from the Barroco, from the Baroque period. This looks like Portugal. I mean, I look at this and this is Portugal. And for those of you that live in Portugal, you know exactly what I mean. And uh, this is quite our, the, the connection between Brazil and Portugal is far beyond our common language, which is the Portuguese. They speak with a much better accent, much more mellow, much more sweet. We are, in Portugal, we are much, much more. <laughs> anyway, that's what the foreigners say. Important is the trade names. Because we are used to refer to topaz as yellow topaz, orange topaz, pinkish orange, pink or red topaz. But sometimes you come across this expression, which is imperial topaz. And it's a very interesting expression that typically it refers to the deepest orange pinkish varieties, not the yellows, not the oranges, but the really strong yeah, um, pinkish orange uh, varieties. And the literature doesn't agree on what is the origin of this uh, color descriptor, if you wish, of this trade name. Some they say that have to do not with Brazilian topazes, but with the uh, Russian pink topazes that were discovered in the mid uh, 19th century. On other books in the literature, you read that it has to do with the second emperor of Brazil, Pedro II that was given and came across those fabulous 
topaz is from Muru Preto, and on his honor, uh, the name was given. But that's only, it's, the literature is not definite on that. But on the 18th century, the name Imperial Topaz was in existence, which is, I mean, just a curiosity. Pink Topaz was also common. Louisa, she will show you a couple of examples. But sometimes the pink was even enhanced by a colored red foil bag, like you can see on these rings. On this monstrance, you look at the topazes, and they almost look all of the same color. Remember what I've told you about the amethyst. So this happens the same here with topaz, where actually the yellow color or the orangey color of the topaz actually is the color of a colored foil bag, not the color of the topaz. If you look closely, uh, look at this stone, the topaz over here. I, I, I think you can see my mouse. Not my mouse, but my mouse. Ah, stupid joke. And you can see that the topaz is quite uh, light in color. And the orangey tone that you see over there, it's the color of the foil back. And this is quite interesting. Louisa, now the floor back to you because people, they don't want to hear me, they want to see you. Uh, I'm going to uh, topazes and you can see this one. This is a stomacher. Uh, this, this piece is in top of the, and again, what we said was quite right because they are sort of, a, they are orange with a pinkish tone. But like the, the, like the, the, the coral uh, necklaces that Enzo was talking about, or the pearl, uh, pearl uh, necklaces, this is quite difficult to find uh, the same, same material like topazes on the same precise shape shade so what they did and you can see mo some of them you well i don't know if you can see them very closely you can see something you have to put me uh, up i'm sorry i can't see any i can't see quite quite out of focus uh, okay so sorry so um you can see the back foil on the back and one thing is also important the foil was not only to give color, the same color and even the color between all the stones, but also to give some extra shine in the back. So the lights go through, goes around like we explained on the diamonds, well on not so many, uh, not on topazes, not so, many, so much cuts, so not so much uh, going around, but sunlight goes on the back. So what happened, if you have a, a mounting, sort of a half egg mounting, um, open mounting, you have to put the foil on the back so if could be uh, extra shined um, silver uh, uh, leaf and you could put it on the back and give it some color and the light goes through and comes back again. So it makes the, the color shine more. These ones are particularly well done because they were uh, restored recently, not long ago by our, our restorer, our main restorer, Galmira Maduro, and she's amazing. She does wonderful things in all our pieces from uh, of jewelry and silver all their work is absolutely stunning this is to show you an 18th century piece is absolutely different from the 17th century i showed you uh, you have you don't have the engraving anymore and you have this a bit stiff um, mounting and more uh, more hard mounting because the the amount of stones were much bigger and the metal was there to give, to give it exactly the stiffness and the, the weight and the strongness that this kind of piece is needed. Who asked me in the morning, how, I think someone asked, how did you hang these kind of things? This is to be worn in, the, in your stomach, in front of your stomach, so to accentuate your shape and your tiny, uh, well, that, their tiny waist. So this hook, was it was hooked on the uh, um, a small piece of the, of the fabric and these uh, tips were sewed to the they could be sewn to the to the fabric so they wouldn't fall so this one i'm going to show two pair of these this is another thing these two pair this is the most typical types of uh, uh, topazes, jewels in Portugal from the 18th century. There's a lot of them still on the market, still in families, there's a lot of them, and there's very typical, very common, and very appreciated. Still on today, uh, feel, uh, families love them and still use them. I'm going to show you one thing, one more 
uh, this. Hui was, talk was talking about uh, pink topazes. You, maybe you can't see the, you can see the shine. I can see, Hui, can you put my image a bit bigger so I can exactly see what I'm doing? Oh. Because I'm, I'm looking at you. Remember, I'm looking at the small thing. And you are a, as uh, the the image is as large as it can get. Okay, so uh, you are looking at uh, uh, this beautiful pendant. Uh, it has uh, three hanging from the the girandole. They are oh, now I can see better. They are like this. You can see them on top. Uh, and this uh, this is all pink topazes. Maybe you can see this the light light pinkish tone that they have. Uh, and this is quite rare. We have a few uh, jewels with this. I've already seen a few jewels with this, but like this one uh, so is so different from the regular shape, which is this one, that this, this piece is absolutely amazing. Let me show you the back because I think it's worth seeing. Uh, sorry, they just came from Restore That so they all have this. Okay, you see? It's quite an engineering process and it's absolutely stunning. I, I love the back of the pieces. When you look at the front of a piece, you, you, this is to hang on the dress also, in front of you, on the stomach. Um, when, you, when you look at the piece, you have to see the beauty on the front, but it's history on the back. You have always to look at the back of a, a, a jewel to be sure what happened to jewel because everything is on the back. You are all restorations or everything that was changed. You can see, usually you can take a look and see if it's real, if it's good or uh, if anything happened to the jewel. So, um, okay. we're supposed to show some more um, different uh, topics, right? I, wa I, want to sh I want to share with all the audience uh, this one because it's, uh, sorry. This one because it's quite um, quite important one, not not this one. Sorry, this one here. And I I, I know yeah. that you want to say yes. something about this. Yeah, this is belongs to a private collector, uh, uh, someone that is really uh, ama amazing, uh, and um, she's a very sweet lady that sent us these images. I already saw them in hand, and uh, one thing is important. Uh, I'm showing you. Oh, sorry, not my camera is still on. Okay. No, don't uh, worry. This, don't worry. Okay. So the image you're looking at, this set, is a pendant on the middle, and you have a two pair of ear, a pair of earrings, and you have a ring. Well, this is a family heirloom, obviously, and this passed from daughter to daughter. And on on the 50s of the 20th century, when this uh, marvelous lady got married, her parents. A set um, made a special setting for the all together so the bride could use it and you can show and she sent us the photo of her daughter that also use it and you see it's is worn like a tiara I think it's pretty amazing and you can still see on the uh, on weddings in Portugal you can see still see them uh, people still wear them and use the jewels, the 18th century and 19th century jewels. It's quite safe here, so you can use whatever you want. And uh, I have a terrible thing, is that I, I, lo I lost all my shame uh, when, I was, uh, when I turned 50. So uh, now I go straight to the ladies and ask them, and I present myself, and ask them to see, to show me their jewels. And they are obviously after two minutes they off and I'm already holding the jewels and taking photos of the front and the back and my husband trying to make a scene and bringing me out, taking me out, but I can't resist because it's still amazing how many jewels, 18th century jewels are still worn in Portugal. I will, I will uh, try to do it because I, I think it's, a, it's nice to meet the ladies. It's Yes, well, the, the ladies usually they're, they're well married and they are all already in this, their age, uh. but still, <laughs> sorry, but still, uh, it's a privilege because usually they ask that they ask me to go to their home a few days later or a few weeks later to see the rest of the jewels. And trust me, there are still a lot of jewels in, in those families, and they are absolutely stunning, uh, this kind of uh, uh, to look at, and it's amazing, and people love to show them. So when they trust, obviously, or they and trust us. Louisa, maybe one, one of the things that you might see on, on, on one of those 
hair ornament. Uh, now I'm, I'm sharing on the screen. Can you tell us a little bit more about this hair ornament? Yeah, yeah uh, I had one in my hand. Maybe you can so, so just show, can you just show it what I'm going to, uh, because it's necessary to explain this. You okay. see them? Yep. So this is a hair ornament, a pure Portuguese 18th century ornament. Most of, we have uh, over 170 of them. Look at this, look at the back. Uh, you have this kind of uh, curl that makes it shake and do this when you walk, you could shake. So imagine yourself with it, uh, not you, but uh, imagine myself with a wonderful uh, silk dress with all my jewels, best jewels, two bracelets, one pendant, um, <laughs> a choker, or rings, whatever, with wonderful best jewels you have. And you go to a ball. Now imagine yourself with a, a wig, a wig with a structure on it, and you could pin these kind of nasty things on it. So we have uh, all kinds of, uh, of uh, uh, these kind of jewels. We have dozens and dozens and dozens of flowers, different flowers with different colors, sometimes in pairs, in three powers, in three pieces. We have suns, stars, butterflies, dragonflies, I'm, um, share, I'm sharing now uh, exactly. with so, so, you so this everybody is a can very, see. Very, very tiny, uh, very tiny uh, setting for uh, an exhibition we did in Luxembourg. Uh, we have a Love Me Nots, which was a very, very uh, favorite uh, thing. We had rings with Love Me Nots and these hair ornaments and even necklaces. Uh, and this, uh, imagine you go to a ball with hundreds of candlelights with all this shaking in your hair. It was called of a was sort of a garden uh, and, and moving, a moving garden. It should be wonderful. One thing I would love to really see it, um, I have a long hair now, but uh, not enough to, to do a wig, but one day I'll try, trust me, I'll try. Not oh. in my head. Lisa, I, uh, we, we, we had still only have like six minutes to go before, okay. before this but closes. I'm, uh, I'm I'm nearly over. Um, let me just say that that uh, showcase that you showed before, that big one with a lot of them, we did it for an, an exhibition about a year ago, this one. And this is SF everything. They, they were about almost well, over 170 pieces. So it was amazing and it really worked well. So, um, so it's really good for you to, to be sure that on, when we open in the end of the year, these showcases will be back again because people loved it so, so much that it's going to be wonderful. You can find it the most wonderful pieces there. So go. And Lisa, can, can we move on to the uh, Bem Posta? We yeah, just, okay. we have, and we will skip a lot of things because we, we don't really don't have much time. Yeah, but I'm sure okay. that everybody wants to hear you talking about uh, um, uh, sure. Jewel silver work. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So in Portugal, as I told you, we had a lot of fun with jewels, with gems. And there were so many that after the jewels, the, the jewel makers and the silver makers were starting to think, where can we apply them? So they, close, they, they were close by and they start to do, uh, use them uh, in silver work and gold work. So we have several of these pieces in Portugal. Uh, the best one definitely is one, the one from the Cathedral of Lisbon that is made in gold and is, um, is um, the, the gold is sweeter and tender, more tender to work with. So the gemstones apply them is, they are absolutely stunning. The guild work, the gold work is absolutely stunning and the gems apply them are stunning. But this one is called the Bem Posta Monstrance. is one of the main pieces here at the museum. Uh, it's also- Can, can you go, uh, everybody's wishing you to go closer. Go closer, yes, I'm trying. I'm going to try, not to be in front of the light. I'm going to start on the bottom. Uh, it's really interesting because not only we can see, you see it well. Yes, uh, the Not only the we can see, yeah, the, the, the gemstones apply to them, but we also can see the, the silver work and look at this, you can see flowers on it. It's amazing. You can see those huge emeralds, that marvelous amethyst you already mm -hmm. studied. 
that amethyst this has flowers. a great deep color. It's quite unique. It's quite yeah. good quality amethyst. Yeah, and you have these flowers. You see these chrysoberyls and you have capuchon flowers here. Do you want me to share a detail or, or, or you, you go, uh, maybe you, you, you go as, it, as you are and the people want to see the piece, not the, not the photograph. It's, it's the emerald, the flowers with the emerald eye. And then you go up, you have this kind, you have different colors. Let me show you this. You have different colors on the flowers. They could play with it, with it. There were so many, so impressive. Look at this. This is already in, not in diamonds, but the flowers, center flowers in topazes. And can, like can you this focus on, on the uh, rose cut uh, imperial topaz that are? Uh, let's at, try. In the can you see them? Uh, that one, the big one. Yes, yeah, the I big one. Because yes. I, I want I want to, this to one? call the attention. I don't know. If I know it's the other one. I'm you, you, you know exactly which one I mean. Yes. You are seeing orange colors, this and one. then all of a sudden you see red, and this is like the best quality of topaz that you can find. It's it's a reddish topaz. It's a Brazilian ruby, as they used to be called in the 18th century, and this is like the bah, top, and a, a good a nice indication of how antique this cut may be. It's rose cut, and usually topazes, they were cut uh, in rose cut in the first half of the 18th century. Then they started to be cut in other types of cuts, but this is a really rare color. And when you compare with both of, with the other two, the other two are orange, and this one, it's like amazing, amazing uh, imperial color. Yeah. And we have the top. Now we know that this, this one was from another monstrance that was bought by Prince uh, Pedro, that uh, he married it, actually married his niece that became the queen in May 13, 1777. So it will be uh, birthday, the birthday of this uh, piece next week. And we know that. And because this piece was made by, um, first for a silver maker, obviously, drawn by uh, an architect. But after that, during the restoration that, that uh, Belmira did, the restorer we work with, under this part, we discover when we remove it, we discover the signature of the jeweler maker. The name was Adin, Adam Gottlieb Poli. And this man was so proud of it that he, even if he could, he could, he couldn't uh, present his signature. He hid, he hid it behind, uh, under the, uh, uh, a part of silver. So someone, maybe someone, well, or no one, but he knew that his name was on it. He also wrote on another another part of the of this monstrance. He wrote that it, it was ordered by the king Peter the second, the one that married his niece, uh, when they when they ascend to the throne of Portugal, May 13, 1777. So this is a unique piece that you know for the signature of who make it, who made it, and who ordered it, and the date. It's amazing. It basically sets the dates for all the previous and the later ones, and it's, a, it's a, um, one absolutely stunning piece. But let me just tell you one more thing, that in Portugal, we have not only this monstrance, this huge, there are about five huge monstrances, uh, the jeweled monstrances in Portugal, but there's hundreds probably of these the smaller and more modest uh, monstrances that they were decorated on the 18th century, even the 17th century ones were decorated with gemstones from Brazil on the 18th century. So this tradition of uh, jeweled the, the, the silver work that was very popular in, uh, in Portugal. And it, it's, it's amazing. Every church you go, there's always a small piece, a small monstrance with gems on it. So wow. it's quite an amazing. And try to go see the other one and this one in the museum because they are absolutely a must. We have an, one more uh, on display and now we're restoring another one with uh, topazes and diamonds, and we have another one with the chrysoberyls and diamonds. So there's a, that's one thing I'd like to, may probably end my, my intervention, is saying that um, 
the gems from Brazil allowed us to have fun with uh, with uh, um, with color, with uh, jewels, with silver work, and sometimes remember what I said about the convents and the promises, the paying of promises. Let me just show you this because you're going to show some details. This part was belonged to a previous earlier monstrance and it was made by a duchess and this is her earrings you see I'm them i'm going to share i'm going to share the yeah. details so people can actually oh, you see the details yeah. yes this is her hearing on the on the side is uh, is the the small part of the top of the earring so it's rubies and diamonds and this is a hair ornament which is absolutely stunning this kind of type of things it's sort of a memory of the owner of the order, the person that ordered this kind of piece is a memory to her, to her soul. And especially the diamonds, you saw many colors on the bottom, but the diamonds, the most precious parts of the, of the, of the monstrance and the most personal part of the monstrance is around the place where you put the Holy Host, the body of Christ consecrated. So this is very emotional also not just a, a very uh, expensive piece, which it is, and more now than ever, but this is a very emotional thing. So I think jewelry and, and, and the jewelry is a very emotional thing. You can wear it or not. So it's most impressive decorative art for me because it's a very, it's so, it touched the, your skin if you want it. It's yeah. amazing. Well, what a wonderful way of, uh, we're just three minutes after the hour. We still have a, a few, a few minutes for some Q&A, but what a wonderful way of uh, finishing the presentation. Oh. I Honestly, okay. I did have some more slides to share, but I think I'm positive that everyone, they wanted to see uh, what your cell phone was capturing and not exactly uh, my very boring slides. So thank you very much, Louisa. And uh, I, I have here a few questions that, that people are, are wondering I have here one from Susan Jacks. I don't know if it is Susan Jacks from GIA. That she's asking, mm -hmm. why were diamonds backed with the black, um, with the black substance in the 16th and 17th century? Okay, you want me to answer this? Yes. Okay, so uh, on the, especially on the 16th and on the 17th century, there were huge uh, collections of diamonds, very important collections of diamonds on 17th century very big sort of like Mazarin, the cardinal, French cardinal. And the, 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 usually the, the diamonds were blackened in the back because like I told you, the mounting, usually the mounting is put on silver, is made on silver. So you can bring the grayish tone. So it was considered that the blacker, the back, the grayish tone you get from the diamond is the opposite. This one is the late 18th century, early 19th century. You know where it came from and the family. And see, you saw the ones that was on the 18th century that everything was covered. Now here on the 19th century, you open is absolutely opposite. The early 19th century, you open the, the mounting and it's absolutely opposite. You want to see the light going through. So it was a tradition. And that black dot, like you, you said very well, very well pointed, is in, uh, very important. So it was a, a way to trick maybe many people that thinking that uh, there's a black spot in every diamond. And if you see a black spot, you're looking at a quartz that looks like a diamond, but it's not a diamond. So be, be aware when you buy something. <laughs> I, I think I will, I will just, uh, uh, to, to just to, to complete whatever you were saying, Real quick, I'm going to share a couple of slides explaining people why we were explaining about the black dot that I mentioned in diamonds. I didn't mention for the other colorless gemstones like topaz, uh, which is uh, today we don't see much white or colorless topaz because it's basically treated, irradiated or, or coated in the pavilion to change its color. But also uh, the, um, the foils that we see on those colorless diamonds are pretty much like this yeah. Let me show you in, uh, in maybe you can comment on the on this image now Louisa on, on yeah. the image of the foil okay so you see you have the mounting you can show it uh, with uh, with uh, the cursor to to people you can see the mounting the the place where the stone should be set and it was done one by one so 
if you see a piece without stones, you see a lot of uh, uh, bulbs uh, on reverse, you see. Each bulb recovers, was uh, need, needed to be filled with a stone. So if you fill it just with a stone, you didn't get that much, much uh, light and you didn't get the, light, the color if you wanted. But if it's like this one, that is a white stone, is a white, I think is a white uh, rock quartz. crystal, right? Yeah, rock crystal, exactly. It's a quartz, it's a quartz. So uh, you could put that small foil, you see the, the round one, that's a small, it's sort of a sheet of a uh, very, very thin sheet of silver. You polish it a lot. You, so you get a lot of uh, li light coming up, and you put it inside, inside the, the um, you put it inside the, the inside that box, the, the, the setting, box, the setting not box, the yeah. setting, and then you put the, the 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 stone on the on top, so you get the shine, the extra shine from behind. That's why I, sometimes those those stones shine so much; they they seem to glow inside. That's because of the foil. Exactly, and uh, everybody's seeing this black thing over here. And uh, when we look it closer, if we look at the black dot closer, which we have a magnification over here, and if you look at what is exactly the culet facet, the culet facet is not the same as the black area, meaning that the black area is painted. So, to, and it was painted to give the illusion that you get with those diamonds that I, I've just spoken. So to paint a black dot on a colorless gemstone like topaz, quartz, rock crystal, or very light near colorless beryl, uh, which are basically really light aquamarines, it was really common on the 18th century, early 19th century. And in Portugal, uh, we see, and in Portugal, those stones, they were called Minas Novas, which is a very common Portuguese trade name for this kind of material, uh, topaz, quartz, and beryl. And they are faceted, they are colorless, they are set in closed settings with a reflective non-colored foil back and with a, with a culet that is painted. Uh, curiously, the term, the trade term is from the 19th century. But in, in antique dealers, we still see 18th century uh, uh, jewelry pieces with this kind of colorless materials being called Minas Novas. That's an anachronism, but it's a trade term. It's not a gemological term. Okay. So I was looking at the, the questions. I don't know if you want to answer a few more. I was trying Lisa, to... the floor is yours, and you, you, you are the invited specialist, okay. and I'm no, sure no, that no. Uh, uh, th there's somebody uh, here. Uh, no, but actually, there is a one, one interesting question that has to do with the museum, and um, mm -hmm. Darlene Wong, she's asking what percentage of the collection has been donated or is purchased by the museum. So how did the, uh, the museum... Why does the museum has this huge uh, jewelry collection? You just replied a few minutes ago uh, indirectly, but maybe now you can clarify. Yeah, but I didn't reply fully. That's that's the truth. Uh, so the majority of the collection, and especially the first uh, part of the collection, was made from was gathered from the convents and from the churches and monasteries. But after that, uh, the state has been buying every time we can, which is not very often, unfortunately, but we, we have been buying some jewels uh, like that, that one. I'm sorry, let me show you this one. This one was bought on the market and sometimes we managed to buy uh, some pieces. This one was bought too. Uh, but there's a lot of donations too. That's interesting, that's being uh, done lately. Uh, some people uh, that, that don't want to uh, imagine you have a very, very rich piece and you don't want to, to be dismantled a setting, for, for instance, with two or three pieces and you want, don't want to be dismantled between your children or you have a problem with the family, well, whatever. So some people leave it, uh, sometimes because they, they were owned by their parents and they, they want to make sort of an homage to their parents and they leave to the museum in the name of their parents. So every time it is published, the name of the parents will be published too. So it's, I think it's pretty nice in the, uh, uh, idea 
uh, and we have been gathering a lot of pieces like that. One thing we have to, and besides these European jewels, especially Portuguese and Spanish jewels, Spanish jewels we have a very large um, um, set of uh, about, about over 400 pieces from Goa and from India, because mainly from Goa. What, some of them came now uh, on the few years, is a sort of a treasure, but that's another story. Uh, but another one came from the 16th, 17th century, also offered to the convents, after also offered as promises. And um, that's why we have a sort of a, from the 15th century to the 19th century, and now we're gathering the late 19th century and, uh, and even the 20th century. We already have a, a lot of pieces, so one day we can enlarge and enlarge our space. Now we're going to uh, conquer for jewelry a, a new space, a, a bigger one. Um, and uh, I hope when the, the day, one day that museum grows bigger, then we can um, enlarge even more because really we have an amazing collection of jewels and we have an amazing collection of silver work and gold work that truly needs a lot of space and to be seen. The jewels are something that usually visitors come over and get be dazzled. And now that it was restored, this is stunning. The, the shine, I, think, I don't think that uh, my phone makes uh, enough credit, to give enough credit for the pieces, I'm sorry. No, uh, we, we, we sh uh, I invite everyone after yeah. lockdown to travel to Portugal, bring a lot of your dollars, euros, what have you, because our economy, we love your money. And uh, <laughs> visit the museum, eat our food and drink our wines. And Luizinha, I see here a, a couple of questions. Some I'm going to reply, some which are the difficult ones I'm going to send back to you. One is, uh, <laughs> has to do with, uh, one you can reply real quick, Mafalda Teixeira, she's, uh, asking what is the translation in Portuguese of a stomacher, the van corsage? Okay, what we call in Portuguese is ornament spite. Ornament which is a ornament spite, yes. The van corsage is a, the name in French and stomacher is in a, the name in English, but all means the same that you, you, you're uh, decorating your uh, stomach. That's the way to put your stomach. Some of the, the jewels, especially the 17th jewels, was supposed to be worn on top, much higher, like this one, this one. But these ones on the 17th century were already stomachers and like this one. You see the shape, the triangular shape you have on, the, uh, uh, on your stomach and the one that points to a, a tiny, a tiny uh, waist. That's the idea to enhance your figure. And in your, well, everything is, all the jewels are meant for that. And Lisa, the people are also asking, what would you recommend as uh, reading, as further reading books on the jewels from the collection? Okay, so in the morning I referred one fundamental book that is from Lino Doré, our previous curator. Uh, she, but the problem is the book is, I think it's uh, almost out sold out. And it's, Yes, out of print and is uh, on sale uh, um, on Amazon. But for an absurd, I think it's a completely crazy price. I think over a thousand dollars. So I, I would consider your books, Rui, I forgot to say this morning, but you have several books that you show a lot of uh, Out of uh, print pieces. also. Oh, really? So um, we have uh, also Diane Scarsbrick, the one she did on Portuguese jewelry, not only Portuguese, but there's a lot of jewelry that's not Portuguese. Which sought to be an S.J. Phillips, two, Sotheby's, three years Yes, ago. exactly. It was a, a, a sale about a, uh, two years ago. And uh, after that, there was um, um, another sale here in Lisbon of Portuguese jewelry by Sotheby's. So those two books uh, are, are very, really good if you can catch any book from Rui, it's amazing. But uh, I can tell you that with the opening of this exhibition, I hope uh, by the end of the year, I'll be able to publish a book with uh, Portuguese jewelry, uh, not only with our collection, but with a lot of pieces that I know that still exist in, in churches and I've been visiting them. I've been photographing them and also from private collections. You have no idea how many there are still in private collections and they are 
absolutely stunning. And there's a lot of paintings sometimes portraying these kind of pieces, which is going to be, I think will be amazing for the piece, not for my book, but for the business of course. itself. And the <laughs> Li Rui Peng, she's asking, uh, uh, I think you've addressed this, but maybe uh, it's, it's good to clarify, why the yellowish green or greenish yellow chrysoberyl was so popular in Portuguese jewelry. And may I add also in Brazilian jewelry, because when I was with you mm. in Rio de Janeiro, many, many years ago, we, we, we visited the Museu yes. Historic Nacional and some of those jewelry, uh, they had really had chrysoberyl silver jewelry and gold jewelry as we have. Yeah. Why was it so well, popular? I think the popularity is due to the amount of them, the, the, the existence of them. If you have, uh, well, if you have tons of uh, uh, chrysoberyls arriving to Lisbon, they were not, uh, that made the market very uh, less expensive to this kind of, uh, of colors. They were very bright, the, the, it's very cheerful, the color. So the yellow is some, usually, I don't like yellow, truly, mm. but <laughs> there's a lot of people that like them and it's very shiny and it's very easy to apply and to mix with another colors. So uh, the obvious reason for, my, for me is because there were huge amounts of, uh, of these jewels coming to Portugal and being used obviously by the jewelers in uh, Rio de Janeiro. We didn't speak about that, but obviously they were being done uh, in Rio de Janeiro, and that's why they, they were worn. But there's a lot of them in topazes. Trust me, the, you, you find probably easier uh, pieces from 18th century Portuguese jewelry in topazes than crystal bells. It must be half half, but uh, I go for the topazes. They are more common because probably the amount of uh, topazes arriving in, in Portugal was much bigger. Mm. So, um... Another one uh, which uh, uh, it's quite interesting is, uh, oh, the Sushil Goyal, my good friend from New York, the, the one that told me how, how to pronounce Jaimatari. I, I know it's because of you, Sushil. <laughs> I, I will really miss you, my friend. And the, the, the foilbacks, uh, we just explained that. And also, oh, Julio Sanchez asks why tourmalines were not featured in this type of jewelry. And I, I, I personally have never came across a tourmaline in uh, 18th century Portuguese jewelry. I don't know if you have, Lisa, but I haven't. I suppose that it has to do with the deposits. Yeah, exactly. Again, it's not a, um, a very common. I think I've already seen, um, I can't remember. I, think, I don't think it's an 18th century, but a 19th century uh, piece with tourmalines. But uh, a ring, I think we have a ring actually, I'm not sure. Uh, but you've seen the, the PCD, if you're not saying it's, uh, 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 we already just studied all the collections. So if you're saying there's no tourmalines, there, there, there's no tourmalines. I don't understand the thing about uh, gems. Just, that's, that's who business. But um, I, think, uh, I think tourmalines, they, are, they appear on the 19th century, like the, well, some kinds of, uh, of gems become more popular and in 19th century. Maybe they become more, well, we, we don't, after 23, we don't have Brazil anymore. So the, the gemstones, the, the, the gem business is very different in Portugal. And also the jewelry become very different. So um, I don't know exactly why tourmalines, they didn't fancy probably. I can't, I can't explain why. Actually, there are on the literature reports and yeah. uh, even on toponymics on the names of the places, mountain of uh, Montanha da Esmeralda, Serra da Esmeralda, Serra da Safira, and they have nothing to do with emeralds and sapphires. They do have to do with uh, uh, green and blue tourmalines, but that's something that I'm sure that somebody in Brazil has studied all those toponymic places, but they were not actually used Although, interestingly, some tourmalines from Maine in the USA, they were quite popular in China in the 19th century. But that's another yes. topic for maybe another webinar. So another, Lisa, yeah. I think I'm going to wrap up and to okay. thank you really very much for, for having accepted this uh, challenging uh, uh, invitation to join us uh, twice a day on the Home Gemology Webinar supported by Sibjo, the World Jewelry Confederation. 
thank you very much. Uh, um, I mean, you were fantastic and you are or, already a pro using your phone and, uh, and your mm -hmm. passion, I, it, I, it's really inspiring. And I could hear you for ages, but we are 21 minutes past the hour. And so we must close the room. Okay, if you do, uh, I was saying if you do more five times, I think I'll, I'll, I'll be, well, fantastic, not now. But still, thank you for, it, for this, uh, this opportunity. And thank you, Sidjo. Uh, I think it's worth seeing. I love to show these jewels. I really love them. And they are amazing. And they are, I'm learning every single day. And your webinars have, have been very, very enlightening, even for the study of the jewels, because we look at the, these uh, gemstones from a different perspective. So thank you so much for your generosity. You, if you never, all of you, if you never work with food, it's quite fun to work with. It's always fun like this. Uh, when it gets to business, it's very silly. But uh, when it's, it's always fun to work with you. And thank you for my, so much for your invitation. You, you did great. I mean, you did, I, I had no doubt that you did great. And uh, we, we had all the help with, uh, of Edward Johnson in the yeah. back. He was yeah. supporting me with, uh, with the questions and uh, helping me out, uh, pointing me out the, the good questions and uh, with your comments. Because as you see, I'm always looking at the camera. I hardly see what's going on in the, uh, in the room. So it's, it's uh, quite challenging to look at the camera and not doing like uh, webinars like this. So it's quite strange. I just look at the camera. I have no idea what you are saying. So thank you, Edward. You, again, you were super. Oh, but really, I've had the most marvelous time. Luis says, thank you so much. And I think everybody in the chat room is just so grateful. I feel exhausted because I've been looking at the questions. I've been looking at the chat but I've wanted to look at the jewels the whole time. It's just absolutely wonderful. The little hair ornament piece, oh, just yeah, delightful. Yeah. Obrigado so much. And everybody really enjoyed your time. Thank you. Can you recall everyone about your webinar this week? Oh, really, again? Well, tomorrow, Thursday, we'll be talking about business. It's so boring compared to these beautiful stones. Come on. <laughs> So thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Louisa. You've been great. And thank you also the museum staff that supported you. So you yeah. could be there. The people um, in the back. Yeah, they are in the back. Uh, people that are in the back, they, they are really important. So thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Keep safe. The unlock is starting, which is good news for all of us. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye.